Welcome to Harvest to Pour, the business of beverages, with your host, Matthew Schiff. This is the podcast for all of those who are involved in the agriculture all the way to the distribution of beverages. And now your host, Matthew Shipp. Hello and welcome to Harvest of Poor. I'm your host, Matthew Shipp, and today I'm here with Parker Pukta. The, he's a co-owner of Adam Pukta Winery. How are you doing today? Pretty good. Yourself? I'm doing really well. I'm excited to talk to you. So Adam Pukta Winery, this has been in the your family for, I think it was seven generations, right? Yeah. So we're the oldest continuously owned family farm winery in the United States. I'm president in seventh generation. And then I have the eighth generation B3 here in May. Wow. Oh, yeah. awesome. Great. And so go ahead and let us know a little bit about the history of Adam Cook the Winery, how it came to be. I know it's got a long history, sort of history goes back to the 1800s and how you found yourself where you are today being the president of the winery. Yeah, so basically our our family immigrated from Germany, from uber area in, in the 1839, they, they immigrated to the U.S. We have documentation that they were here in Herman by 1841. And Adam's father, Johan, he bought some property here, planted some grapes, and that kind of started their their wine making journey here in Herman. They had done been doing this prior in Germany, and then basically Adam got got started in it, bought some property from his dad here, which now is the property of the winery, and uh, made his first vintage off from his dad's vineyard, and uh, opened the winery in 1855, and then uh, we operated until Prohibition. And then my grandpa and and dad reopened the winery in 1990. And, uh, you know, so for that duration during Prohibition to 1990, we were closed. Did Family did a lot of farming and stuff here on the property. And uh, yeah, dad was a respiratory therapist. My grandpa was a judge and a lawyer. So complete opposite. Wow. Something I guess that interested dad and really had a passion for wanting to reopen it. And he, he learned under Dave Johnson and some other guys up at Stonehill and just slowly started reopening the winery with my parents and help from a lot of friends and family to get the thing, you know, reopened. And yeah, so that's kind of, that's kind of where we're at. And, you know, 2025, we'll be celebrating 170 years of the winery being here. And yeah, it's pretty exciting. To, to have the the type of history because it's you just don't find that that length duration of businesses and and family history very often. All right, so correct me if I'm wrong. I think I heard you. So this is the seventh generation. You're the seventh generation, and are you the the oldest continuously in the family owned in the nation? Mm-hmm. Yep. So we're not the oldest winery. Uh, but we are the oldest continuously owned family winery. So it's been in our family. It's, you know, it's not op- been up. Op- there's, a, there's mm-hmm. kind of a differentiation. There's, there's wineries yeah. that are, you know, older that are in continuous operation and there's mm-hmm. wineries that are older than us, but they're not either in the same family or, or vice versa. So Gunlock Bunch, you know, if you're familiar with them, they are 1858 and we are 1855. Wow. So. And they are in their sixth generation, I believe, in the business. I, I wouldn't be surprised if the seventh is is close behind somewhere in there now. Wow, that's that's really cool. And so you said you yeah you said you were kind of off after so prohibition kind of shut things down. I, I looked on your side. You guys had to destroy a lot of the equipment. Some of it you you managed to keep out of the site. And you still have some of that original equipment preserved. And even the one piece I uh, I found was really interesting was that you had, there was a couple of vineyards kind of just off in the woods, like nobody really knows them. Are those still being used today? No. So there's, there's some cr- wild, I guess at this point, they're pretty much wild vines okay. growing up in the woods. Hmm. And our, my plan is to get, get some cuttings off of it and trying to see what they actually are because we, we just want to want to know kind of what they are growing because we don't have a ton of documentation on on some of that. I mean, 
in general, what they were growing here is, is documented, but what on the property, you know, and where it was at, that's kind of something that we want to play around with because there are, there are vines growing everywhere and it's not like a, a wild grape vine, you know, like you can, yeah. you know, it's Grow not trees like and everything hanging great down. Bush, like it is 60 feet up into the trees, you know, there's vineyard, there's, there's tree vines, you know, yeah. and there's like, you can tell it's a great vine. It's so, more components together. Okay. Yeah. So, but yeah. And then I know you kind of asked too, at the same question as, you know, how I got started. Yeah. So, you know, I was, I was born 92 and grew up here on the property, was homeschooled for many years. And that's kind of what I really credit my work ethic to and my, my love for, for the, the business. I was very fortunate to be around, you know, a, a older generation of people, very young and go to wine competitions and dinners and, you know, events that you wouldn't normally f go to as a, as a young kid or in something we can get into later about, you know, struggles and, and, and vision of the company. But also I got to work on hands-on on the business at a young age and get to see things grow and develop and build, you know, whether it's the business itself or le legitimately buildings. You know, so that was, that's something that really kind of stuck with me throughout the years and then kind of, you know, worked here all my life. It's kind of funny when we look at em employee reunions and mine shows up and it says, you know, like the legal, like, oh, I've been here 20 years or something. It's like, no, that you were working when, you know, it was slave yeah. labor kind of thing, you know, <laughs> but yeah, you know, we, I worked here, went in to do some cooking in high school at a restaurant. And then that kind of shifted towards the culinary side. I had already been doing quite a bit of culinary in high school with, you know, dinners and events here. And, you know, we, we kind of gutted our, our, our cellar our actual brick stone cellar in 04. And that's kind of where we started doing some more cooking at and it was either a heavy equipment operator school or culinary school were my two paths and, and the, the cooking side of things made more sense for the winery. Although I still get to play on the heavy equipment quite a bit. So and you're, you're essentially yeah. on a farm. So you get, you get, you get some fun stuff to play with. Yeah. So one of my, one of my favorite stories with that is my dad asked me what I wanted for my 10th birthday. And naturally I said a backhoe. So he <laughs> went actually John Deere's down, like a mile down the road and he went down to John Deere and rented a, a tractor with the head of backhoe attachment on it for three weeks. And I just dug holes, I'd fill them in, dig them up, fill them in, dig them up. So that's kind of where my obsession for that has started. And now my son is, you know, at one, at one, basically one year old, he was already on an excavator. And now he, he's on one of our other excavators and drives all of our tractors. And now I'm teaching him how to drive my truck. So oh my. It, that the is, legacy continues. Uh, the legacy definitely does continue. Yeah. So, uh, and, I, I, uh, yeah. so then I just went in, I went into culinary school, went to East Central, great program there. That's really affordable here in Union, Missouri. And, you know, they, they've, they do a good job, you know here locally. Then went to Annie Guns to do my internship, which was, you know, super, super awesome because I'd been going there since I was a kid. So got to work under, under Lou and great, awesome team there. So I did that for a year while working here part-time still, and came back in 2014, I believe somewhere around there and just kind of hit the ground running and just really started going updating stuff in the business and then get my hands dirty on even more, more things. So you, you went off to culinary school, had a great, more like an internship at Annie Guns, which mm -hmm. is a wonderful restaurant. If you ever find yes. yourself in the St. Louis area, look them up. It's, it's a pretty cool experience. I love the shop they have right beside it. With all the meats and the cheeses and everything. It just makes a one whole cool experience. And then, so I want to get, kind of get into the challenges though. Now, you're coming back to to, to the winery you grew up in with a background or a strong expertise in culinary and, and a unique love for heavy moving equipment. Now, when did you start, did you come back and immediately take over or did you start uh, kind of start 
I mean, you've already seen the wine. You grew up with this. It just be kind of became part of your vision, part of you. When did when did, did you know that you wanted to, to kind of step in as president? So I guess stepping back before we get to the president side of things, I always kind of, I had no real desire to go off, you know, too far because I just, I put in so much work as a kid, uh, you can say, and I just always had a, a, a vision that I was going to be here because the legacy and, and that stuff is a big, huge part and carrying that on, you know, I didn't, didn't know a whole lot, but I knew like, Hey, I can work hard and, and I can improve on things. And so, you know, the whole thing with Annie guns is, was only supposed to be a 240 hour internship. And then they conned me into staying there for a year. And then I got to the point where I was like, you know, Hey, we've, I've, I've, I've learned some stuff. I don't know it all by any means, still don't, but I want to get back to the winery mm -hmm. where the roots are at mm -hmm. and, and do a lot more. So that kind of really started it. And then we started really looking at infrastructure. I started dabbling with, you know, the vineyards more and, and getting out there and spray and, and, and looking at soil nutrition, you know, and by this time I'm, I'm still pretty young. I, I just, you know, basically turned 20, 21 and uh, I just kind of really started getting a grasp of, of what we wanted to do. And me and dad really kind of talked all quiet, you know, all the time he lived here on the property. So, you know, we were always involved in butting heads on, on things for sure, but that's just naturally. Mm -hmm. And so I just kind of, you know, hit the ground running, working, working a ton, fixing some things. And uh, yeah, 2015, you know, we had, had to deal with some stuff, but uh, really just kind of started getting more and more involved in, in accounting, uh, wine, the winemaking side of things, making decisions in the cellar, you know, throughout that, the, you know, mid, you know, 15, 16, 17, that was, you know, those were the years where we really, we had some struggles for sure, just with, you know, dealing with old infrastructure, we're still dealing with some of that, but uh, old infrastructure and just, I would say could be lack of direction of where the company is going. You know, by that time, dad was Oh, probably, you know, 60 years old already. So there was, there was not a whole lot of desire to push the envelope sometimes, you know, and you have the younger generation, you know, piss and vinegar kind of, kind of thing. And, you know, we're like, Hey, we can do this, this, and this, let's do this, let's, you know, kind of thing. So that's, that's where I kind of, you know, got really involved in it for better or right. less. And then dad kind of went through through some personal stuff and I had to kind of step in as, as vice president, you know, and, and really take on some even bigger roles and trying to keep things moving and flowing and working together. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was kind of, you know, it, that was how things moved through there. But yeah, and then when, once you get in, you know, obviously there's a lot more years that we can fill in the blanks there. And then, you know, he recently passed away. Um, last year well 2022 so that's where the the title i guess changed to president right. unfortunately that's that's how that yeah. happened so i'm not a big person on on you know title kind of thing like you know i've been doing a lot of stuff di different things you know we we do a little bit of it all cook we cook here and there i you know in the ditches cleaning stuff and during harvest we're out picking the grapes and you know you do you do a little bit of everything in this business and, and especially when you're in a small business and family owned business, you, you do what has to be done kind of thing, you know? So as you stepped into that, more of that VP role, starting to see things you wanted to push for, change for, what were some of those initial challenges you saw that you really, you've had to overcome to keep the winery going? I think a lot of it was just technology, you know, trying to, trying to use more technology you know, that, that was, you know, that was a huge thing probably that I switched from was our cash register system to a POS system. You know, we were doing the typewriter style. Oh, wow. Sure. You, not, you know, like you get a little thing at Sam's club and 
then you got to relay it into the credit card system. And we were look, I was started looking at transaction times and yeah, I was like, this is crazy. There's got to be a better way. So that was a huge thing was going and we started it first in, in our bistro, which is in the original cellar. Still to this day, that's where we operate our, our on-site restaurant and wine dinner. So that was probably a huge thing in the 20, probably 2018, 2017, somewhere in there. Could have been even a little bit sooner than that, but that was a huge thing. 2015, I introduced wine slushies to the business. That was a huge thing with me and my dad would argue about. And so I ended up just going out and buying the slushy machine myself on eBay from PayPal. And it's, it's a pretty big success. We go, we go through quite a bit and, and that led into building a mobile wine slushy trailer that I take throughout Missouri, mainly St. Louis, Washington area. We do get down to some different areas, but we, it's a mobile wine slushy trailer. You know, we do, we do quite a bit of, of, you know, over 1500 gallons of slushies a year. So it's, oh it's a, it's a big, big, big part of things. Are there any, like for your infrastructure, what were some of the infrastructure challenges you were running up? You said you're constantly having them because it, it's, it is an old, older area. And how does that affect production? Yeah. So, you know, our sales room starting off down there, you know, we had, they had, you know, we had dirt floors in the cellar until 89 and then he built, you know, that's where we started our production down there, tank room in the legit cellar. Then in the original press house that stood above it, you know, we had our tanks in there eventually. In the early 2000s, we ended up getting a, a, bo- a bottling line that wasn't fully automated, but it was it filled and corked it, you know, and then we had some other warehouses added on. So, you know, you're dealing with buildings that are 170 years old, if you know, down in the sales room. Um, and then through planning and not planning, you know, sometimes you outgrow those very quickly. And then you're trying to figure out, you know, as, as you're adding a restaurant and you're adding infrastructure, you're, you know, you're needing more power, more power, you know, adding bathrooms and there's all those facility upgrades that you have to deal with, you know, and dealing with stone buildings and trying to keep the architecture there and, you know, draft, draft, you know, now we're dealing with, with AC units that are 30 years old, 20 years old. You know, so it's those kind of normal stuff. And then on the production side of things, you have, you know, we had a huge growth rate in probably in from the early 2000s up until the economy, you know, collapsed in 08. And that, you know, it took a little bit for it to bleed into our business. But, you know, in the 2010, we, you know, we were doing almost 60, 70,000 gallons. We were bottling or making a year prior to that, you know, so. A huge growth and some of that growth we expanded in, uh, in some areas that we probably shouldn't have in terms of just volume. So some things were, were undersized, like our chilling system, you know, so it made it, you had to work it really hard. We just now recently upgraded that finally to a, a new chiller. And we're currently in the process of adding on, adding on about a 7,200 7, square foot addition for crush pad and some other, other infrastructure stuff. So tell me, you mentioned that you said there's a lot of different consequences to planning and not planning. You you mentioned Mm -hmm. that. Talk a little more about that. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's so many different things. If you, if you look at the vineyard side of things, you know, as you know, you can't, you don't, it's not like corn, you know, just plant it and get the harvest off of it the first year, you know, on a white, you're typically you're Production is three to four years before you get your first harvest. Reds can be anywhere from four to five or three to five. You know, you throw some frosts in there or bad growing season or two years of drought like we had, you know, that, that kind of hurts. So there's a lot of planning that goes into the vineyard side of things. And when you're going to get production off of that and, you know, we're in that phase right now of adding irrigation, well, this is adding irrigation after I've already planted four, five and a half acres in the last three years. Probably should have had irrigation in sooner and started with a little bit smaller vineyard blocks, you know? So there's that, that lesson that you learn through, you know, all of the pieces that lead up to your vision of what you want to create. 
And so for the older infrastructure, it was what happens if we outgrow the space? What is, what is going to be needed? Is there going to be, you know, you're going to need more power. You're going to need more water, more employees. You know, those are all things that you have to take in, into consideration and, and plan for. So some, some larger things that we're working on right now is taking, getting some topography surveying done for grades because we're tucked in the hill all over the place. So that's a, a huge challenge, meeting grades, meeting different infrastructure, and then oversizing everything. You know, if you're, if you're in the ground, put some extra pipe in the ground because you're going to use it. You know, just stuff like that and, and trying to see what the property could look like in, in 10 or 20 years. You know, I've, I've got some things that I, I want to, I would like to see the, the business offer and, and that may take 20 years, you know, or, or whatever. So having architecture designs, you know, all of these things done as a phased pro project is, is something that we're working on so that we, we don't miss the small details that end up hurting us here on because now you got to redo it. And it's like, what was the cost that we, you know, if we could have done things a little bit more thought out and, and you're not going to get everything. It, it's just impossible. Mm -hmm. You know, hindsight's twenty twenty. you know? So yeah, absolutely. You try to do the good, if you did mention vision of what you, you have this larger vision of what you want to create and you just talk about being 20 years out, but you have the goals, the certain goals that get to this point, or at least they're movable goals or they're always in flux. But you also said you were learning from your mistakes. How fast or slow do you think you should recover from those mistakes? And how, you know, so they don't hurt you, but then you just don't knee jerk and try to correct over correct. Yeah. I mean, that's something as an entrepreneur, you know, business owner, leader, whatever you want to call it, you can paralyze yourself by making, you know, getting, getting stuck and not making a decision is just as bad as making a decision. You know, you really got to measure the inputs and the information that you're getting to make the best decision. And at times there are going to be mistakes and you just own it and you move on. You know, nobody's perfect. I, I mess up. I tell my staff, I was like, you know, I know I'm hard on, on people and I know, you know, I have some expectations, but it's like, I mess up every day. I make mistakes, you know, and, uh, you know, it's just you, something you lit, learn, learn by and you keep moving, you know, you can't, cause you can get paralyzed in that. And that's the, the worst thing because it ends up bleeding into the culture and, and the business if, if you get caught there too long, you know, and so that's a, that's a big thing on that. You know, for instance, example, we took over an uh, 18 acre vineyard that's about an hour away and it's a huge undertaking for us and for my crew and, uh, you know, we're not sure how it's going to end up working out, but it was a decision that we weren't sure how, how to navigate it. And it was what I felt was best for right now to, to keep, make sure that we have the, the fruit, you know, cause without that, we have no business, you know, it's a, a pretty, you can't just get fruit from, you know, it's not corn when you're making beer where you can get it any time of the year. We have one shot a year to get in the fruit that we need. And we really don't like bulk, buying bulk wine. We've done it in the past, but we really don't like doing that. We have certain styles of our wines and we like getting them with Missouri fruit. You know, it's a challenge, but it's a challenge getting fruit from say New York. We have more challenges with getting juice from New York in a lot of our aspects when we're, when we're dealing with some of the stuff shortages, like, you know, we get Concord or Vignole sometimes in the past. If, if there's a shortage here, but uh, it's just, it's very high to ask, you know, because they, they can't just, they can't drop that acid up there. So those are some big challenges that we face. All right. Well, this yep. has been a really good section so far of like kind of the entrepreneurial journey you've had and some of the, you know, being okay to make mistakes and you're segueing very nice into the next section here. I was talking about your grapes. In the heart of this podcast is I like talking about beverage industry's journey from harvest to pour. and Again, the harvest is like we just started talking about how you're sourcing your ingredients, where you're sourcing it from, why you're sourcing from where you're sourcing them. Maybe you are, ha you own the complete vertical to your source. The pour is essentially how you make your wine uniquely yours. Why is it different from the winery next door? Or how is it different from the winery next door? 
And the poor is, again, kind of how you talk to your, your marketing, how you talk to your customers, how you get them to come back, what makes them raging fans of your, your wine. So we'll go step back here and kind of continue with what we started to with, with the harvest. So you, I know you, you've been a farm and you, I believe you have some of your own grapes and, but now it looks like you're going outside of that. You talk a little bit about the, those challenges and, you know, how you source and why and how close you can keep do to keeping, I guess you really keep this local. Yeah. So we've got, you know, prior when basically from 89, we had two acres of Norton planted that my dad family planted. And then in the early 2000s, we planted about two acres of Ignol. Since then, there's a few satellite vineyards in, in the Herman, direct Herman area that are Norton's that we take care of. So prior to me planting more, we only had about five and a half acres, right? That we manage. So really everything since the existence of the winery, we buy from other other right. growers in, in Missouri, other wineries, you know, if they have, if we have contracts with them or if they, you know, sometimes we need more stuff during harvest, they don't need it. And we, we all share, you know, stuff when, when somebody needs something, if we got it, you know, you sell it to them. But 99.9% .9 of everything that we need, we, we get from other places and, right. and we love supporting those other businesses because there, there's challenges with running a business and the agricultural side of things. But more recently, we planted about five and a half acres. We got four and a half acres of Vidal, one acre of Verona that we planted in a very low spot. And then this spring, we'll be planting three acres of the Vaught. And then the uh, uh, plan is next year to be planting, 2025 is planting another three acres of Vignol. So we'll have about 18 acres here on site. But we'll still be, you know, heavy, heavily, you know, reliant on outside sources. Now with us taking over an 18 acre vineyard, we were already getting all of that fruit and they, that vineyard about supplied about a third, about a quarter of our total yield was off of that 18 acres. So now was this, this 18 acres, you said you were already pulling from that, but now you're, are you, you bought the land or not the land, but you bought the rice to manage it or how does, how yeah, does that change? Well, yes. Or le e leasing, the, leasing the, the established vineyard and taking over. So there's definitely challenges with that, you know, cause it's not your property. So you, you got to learn that projection because everything that you do, most everything you do in, in the winter and the spring of one year, you don't see a lot of that change until next year, you know, especially when you're adding nutrients to the soil, there's only so much that you're going to get in, in that top section of, of the soil. So it's a long game, you know, when you put ag ag agricultural lime down mm -hmm. one inch per one year in the soil. And you think about vines that are 10, 15, 20 years old, it takes a lot of time for that nutrients to get down into that, you know, larger root system. So there's just, you know, and then if you get into the pruning and you're pruning out old wood, you know, where stuff needs to be retrained completely, you know, some of that takes two to three years to get back to full production of that vine. So there's some huge challenges on, on that side of things, but the whole thing of why I want more fruit here on the premise is one, we have more control of, of the quality of fruit because it's right here. We can get it out of the vineyard quicker. We can manage it a little bit better because it's, it's directly correlated to, you know, better the fruit, the better the wine it makes our job easier. Whereas when you're buying it from contract vineyards, you know, sometimes it's their hobby, you know, they're running full, most everyone's they're running a full-time job and then they're growing grapes on the side. So, and they get paid by the ton, you know, and that's just, it's no different than any farming, you know? So there are certain things that we want to hit from quality standard that might reduce the tonnage, you know, a little bit, it, whether we have to drop some fruit because of it's overcropped or, you know, stuff like that. So there's some challenges and that's why I want to have more, more vineyards here. It's an aesthetic thing. We're a winery. I want to have the vineyards here. If you've been here, we got the rolling hills here, you know, so that those are some of the big things. Is it more cost effective to kind of own that, that vertical in or it, is it, is so it, it just zero it, sum? 
It can be once you get into a large scale. So when we are only taking care of four to six acres, especially our satellite vineyards, it costs us way more to take care of because you have to haul in all this equipment to these little vineyards or they just get decimated by critters because there's just not enough vineyard there to, to, offset. you know, offset it. So we put out about 22,000 feet of bird netting every year on our vineyards here and offsite to keep deer and turkeys and birds out of there. So there's a lot of labor, but you know, we want to produce, sometimes we produce the best fruit that we can get it out when we want it, you know, because the scheduling is a little bit easier. Does the, also, since you are wanting to put more on your own land, you're going to have more influence over how you treat the soil and the soil mm -hmm. types. Will that also eventually pull in the, almost like the varietals of grapes you're growing, will, will that affect, initially affect that soil care, your, your grapes to even further affect the, I'm, I'm coming at this from a culinary kind of affects the, uh, the outcome of the flavors and the, the types of what you can get out of the grapes as wine. Yeah. I mean, you're, you overall, you're just trying to produce the healthiest, the vine, you know, to support the yields that you want to get off of it. And yeah, there's definitely, you know, you want your, your nutrients and your soil to be balanced and all your micronutrients, because that deals with if you, if their pH and stuff is all over the place, then your plants are less likely to take up micro micronutrients. So having just a healthier vine stresses the vine out less and is going to produce a higher quality fruit. When that happens, then it's way easier to make a better wine. I'll probably butcher it, but my dad's, you know, kind of famous line was you can make a really good wine out of good grapes. You can make a bad wine out of good grapes, but it's really hard to make a good wine out of bad grapes. You know, like Very it starts bad. in the vineyard, it starts in the soil, it, it even starts back at, you know, site selection. We don't have good soil here. We are dealing with a ton of clay. Between our two vineyards here, we're looking at putting almost 200 tons of lime down and gypsum lime down again this year. You know, so it's taken me since I came in in 2014 area, I've been working on the soil in our vineyard since then. And it's still wow. not, it's still not where it should be at. Okay. So, so working the soil a lot to get it. Yeah. And it's expensive, especially during 2020, 21 fertilizer and even part of 22 fertilizer was just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you gotta not do it because it's not, you can't afford it. You know, but then on the other side, you don't do it. Then you end up hurting the fruit that year, throw some frost in there and then a drought and it's just a perfect storm. So with, with wow. our new ir irrigation system, we're, we're going to be pulling out of a, a lake. So we're put a retention pond in and we will do some fertigating, which will make things a lot easier and have a soil down will help. So as you gain control of more of the, how the quality of the grape by having it on your land and what you're getting now, how do you feel this is going to affect your production, your, what you produce, and also kind of take us through the process of how you produce your wine to make it at a book to winery wine. So, you know, and, 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 and I'm not, not the winemaker. We have a really good winemaking staff, but our, our biggest thing is to make the highest quality wine that we can, that our consumers enjoy. There are some wines in our portfolio that I don't care to drink as much, not because they're bad, they're just sweet, you know? And I'm, yeah. they're great wines and we sit in there and say, hey, I like this wine. I really wish it was a little bit drier, but what what, have, what is our consumer drinking it for kind of thing? So our, our big thing is we're always trying to make the best wine that we can make, and we never want to push the wine into a category, into, you know, the corner kind of per se that it can't be, you know, you, so minimizing what you have to do to that wine, whether it's filtration or, or certain processing is a huge benefit. And that starts, like I said, out in the vineyard, we, we've been We've been changing a lot of processes in the last probably three to four years since Michael, our, our winemaker retired in 20, beginning of 2020. So we've been changing a lot of processes, but you have to 
change them very slowly because you have to kind of see, well, if you change all at once, you can't measure what the, what, what the change really happened because your grapes are always changing. Your grapes from every single year, every single harvest are never going to be the same. So already dealing with a product that changes consistently on its own. And then you go in and you decide, Hey, we're going to ferment this a little bit cooler this year, or we're going to change the yeast th this year, or we're going to add different enzymes, you know, to help break things down Friars fermentation, you know, so there's all of those different things, or we're going to try different oak this year. You have to make those adjustments very small unless there's just something that you want to start from scratch, but we typically don't want to do that because we're not trying to confuse the consumer. You know, that's why we do some new, new products for our wine club members. And we did bourbon barrel Norton a couple of years ago. We did the preserve Vignol, like we were talking about earlier. We, there's some small batch stuff that we get to play around with and see what people like. Like for instance, we did a, a bubbly, which is a forced carbonated wine that we did to kind of play around with thing and the cult, it's just called bubbly. So it's pretty, it's a pretty good name. And uh, but th that's where we kind of, you know, we want to keep our quality and we want to do the least amount of work to the wine because we want it to express itself and, and be very fruity and balanced. That's something that we really shoot for is how that wine from the start, from the time you smell it to the, you know, touches your lips and your tongue to the time it finishes, is it balanced? Is there enough acid? You know, we don't want something that's too acidic, you know, you want that fruit, fruit forward or, you know, whatever we're kind of working, working towards. What were some of the processes that you, you adapted or changed? So, you know, we make 20, it was it 22 wines. So it, it's product specific, but some of those that we're doing, like I had mentioned, we're, we changed some, some different yeasts. We changed different uh, oak on some of our oat reds. We played around with just there's some different blends from non ML fermented wines with, and then adding some ML fermented wines to some of the blends. We've tried, we've changed cleaning procedures on the other side of things. We've changed a huge one that we started doing was, was we started testing our, which is yeast available nitrogen in house. So that was huge for us when we started testing for that, because then we were able to see how unhealthy our grapes were because it didn't have the nitrogen that it needed to give the yeast, the energy to make a clean fermentation. So that was probably the biggest thing that we, we kind of saw and that then spiraled into having better conversations with our growers, paying more for our fruit, having contracts with them and saying, Hey, at the end of the day, we are nothing without you. And we want to produce the highest quality wine and it starts with you guys. And how can we help you? How can we incentivize you guys? So we started doing soil samples of all of their vineyards and trying to help give them, you know, soil recommendations and stuff like that, if they weren't doing that. And, and that was kind of a huge change and just build it, continuing to build that relationship with them, and, you know, come have them come out for dinners and, and share you know, in, in our experience of, and growth with them. Cause once again, we can't do it alone. Yeah, no, absolutely. And yeah, this is a great uh, way. You also, we're going to go into the pour and yeah, kind of more of the, how the customer, um, well, how, how, you know what your customer likes. And you, you really actually touched on that already with the, co the consumer tasting or trying new little new small batches, having your customers try that out and kind of gauging their, their reaction to it. You tell me a little bit more about that. How often do you use the customer? How much, how often are, how, how do you use the customer? Yeah. So a few points and, and stop me when I start to ramble off, cause I can do that. But a few points, you know, we, we started wine club in 2020. So that's been integral and feedback because we get a, a more intimate conversation with them because they're, you know, really involved with purchasing. So that's one aspect because our wine club members are coming to our events, coming to our dinners, coming to our parties that we do. So you get to a lot more one on attention and one on one continuing with the same people. So you're like, I, you know, and you kind of see what, what they're liking and what they're buying. So that's one thing. 
to, uh, a huge thing is food and wine for us. It's always been a, a huge highlight in our family. You know, German family, we love food. And then we have a winery. You know, we were one of the first wineries in the area. Um, and we still do it to this day that does cert- that does food samples with our wine. So we're known for our key lime cracker with our vignole. You take a sip of the wine, take the key piece of this key lime cracker from Mississippi cheese straw company and then you taste it take a sip of wine again it tastes like a margarita without the salt you That's know we do good. we do our chocolate with our raspberry wine it tastes like a chocolate covered raspberry so we've been doing that and that kind of then leads into why we do dinners why i went to culinary school is that that food and fellowship you think about how many times experiences you've been to any guns it's over wine and food and you're making memories and you're getting to share that with people. And that's a huge, huge, you know, passion of mine and, and what separates us from, from so many is we want to create authentic experiences and, and memories that people can share and, and, and build. It's so awesome still to this day, how I hear from people about from 25 years ago, how they were you know, here closing time and my dad was still doing tastings and it was like, yeah, you weren't even selling the port, but he had a bottle open and, you know, 25 years later, I'm still a customer. I'm still buying port, you know? And so now I have that opportunity. My staff has that opportunity to share in that. And my brother now, since father passed away, has come back into the company. He had been kind of on it in and out throughout the years and went to college at Mizzou and stuff like that. So he's now doing a huge role in our wholesale development on, on the wholesale side of things. So, and that's a whole nother subject, but, you know, basically we want to stand out and make memorable experiences, make an impact in the community and and share in the development of our of our staff and and this goes into training and 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 i know it's it's kind of all subject but at the end of the day if we don't invest in our in our staff and their families you know we're creating a highlight to them and saying you know we're investing in you because our customers are coming to you one of my big things now is we have multiple staff members that their kids work for us because I want to create their an avenue if they would like where they get to create their own family legacy in the growth of the company that can be passed down you know That's right. you know I really like that you said invest in staff and families most people will say they're investing in their staff to make them better which is great but you you took that one step further and you're obviously seeing the results of that yeah I mean it's it, it's well, I, I've really, um, I want to value our people because without them, we have no business. So it's like, you know, and it, it's been tough for me. That's probably been one of my hardest thing being in charge of things at a very young age is dealing, navigating employees that are twice my age that saw me growing up being a little older kid here, just being a kid, you know, getting into trouble. You know, seven days a week because I was homeschooled, and then me being their boss, and that's been t- tough for some people, and it's been tough for me because, you know, you're you're friends with these people, but then there's an expectation that you have to keep with them because at the end of the day, too, it's a business, and and we're a team. We have to operate as a team, and and sometimes it doesn't. You know, families are dysfunctional. So, and businesses <laughs> go through phases. And, and so I want to try and mitigate that. But at the end of the day, we want, we want a memorable experience to our, our customers and their families, um, and, and create lasting memories and experiences. I mean, so for instance, our wine club members, we now have a group of them. It's like, I think three or four couples that are all friends now that when they come in for different events, they all bring their campers to Herman and stay in the campground next to each other, you know? And so we had one of our wine club members propose to, to his girlfriend this past weekend prior to our six course Norton dinner, you know? So it's just, it's making those memories and being able to share in in that is truly. I'm going to sum this up, but you, you've really been pouring into the experience, the memories, and obviously the wine is what they're 
they initially come here for, but they leave with that, those experiences and memories. And I'm sure this is what would you, do you believe this is what really makes them come back? For sure. I, I think, well, I don't think, I think I know because of what people tell us, you know, and I'm not trying to be snooty about that. It's just, we want to focus on that and we want to hear what people say. We want to produce the best wine. And then when we, you know, we try to give some of the best tastings that we have, and that's through training our staff, not only about our wines, but other producers, producers around the world. And we do enrichment training with our staff and we bring wines from, you know, all over the world in Missouri, we want to try other wines and say, you know, these are stylistic differences and just overall education of wine. You go out to California and those, you know, their wine staff is just highly educated. I mean, it, it does, it would not surprise you if you walk in cause it's happened to us. I've only been out there once, but you have a, you know, level three SOM as your wine tasting staff member. You know, it, it happens, you know, and, and so I want to, I want to create that kind of culture where, where we, we rely heavily on part-time staff and I want to build a business to where we can pull, create opportunities where we're pulling from the, the, our part-time staff and, and have more full-time operations for them and, the, and for them, you know, that kind of thing. So. On the, on the customer side of things, you know, we have a ton of different events and experiences throughout the year that yeah. highlight that. So I want to get into the events, but I want to save that, that good stuff for the end here. Yeah. We're getting close to that. Real quick, this is kind of a, a fun question, but what is, this is sometimes the hardest one, so it's the easiest one. What is your favorite beverage? Now, when I ask this, I'm going to say, what is your favorite beverage at your winery? And what is your favorite beverage when you're not at your winery? So if it's wine and it's our wine, it all depends on what I'm doing. So you got to think okay. of the food side of things. Sure. So if ah, we're talking, food, okay, yeah. We're food talking, if we're talking about a steak, ribeye, or any type of, you know, lamb game, it's, I'm going with a Norton. A hundred percent, it's the Norton. Maybe we can, if it's some pork, we'll probably go Chamberson or our judges there. If, if it's fish, you know, I'll find, depending on if I'm going shrimp and it's spicy, I'm definitely hitting up our driving mule with that intense fruit and a touch of residual sugar from keeping some of that juice back that we add. I'm hitting that, you know, spicy shrimp, mango salsa with our driving mule is killer. If I want some oak, I'll hit it because I, you know, I'll hit up our, our shard because we do, we do oak it. And then when we get into the desserts, my number one go-to is our 1855. It's a, it's a Madeira style, you know, sherry, ton of brown sugar notes, caramel goes great with bread pudding. I'm making bread pudding, caramel sauce with it as well. Very versatile for that kind of stuff. So those are kind of my go-tos there. If it's other wine, I'll try anything outside. You know, I want to try anybody's wine and learn as much as I can. Ron Bauer, big buttery Chardonnay is my go-to when it's around. But I, I like everything wine on the semi-dry, basically dry in. But we get into a lot of dessert wines too, and I'll try I'll try anything. On the non-wine side of things, I do really enjoy sour beers. Side project up in St. Louis. I think it's just a correlation between the wine having a bit of sour aspect to it. Why I kind of go on the sour beer side of things. And there's a ton of sour beers out there that are made, that are aged in wine barrels or they have juice in them. We have a local uh, friend of mine that owns Turbulence Brewery here in Herman, Wings of Blazing. We've done some Chamberson beer with his. We'll, we'll be releasing Voyage 2.0 this year at my dad's celebration of, of continued life thing that we've been doing that we're going to do again this year. So it's a kind of a beer for beer for that. We do a couple, couple different beers. We've done some stouts that had our bread pudding in it. So my friends got me into stouts more. I'm not a coffee drinker. And then you get a lot of that in some stouts, but I'm starting to get more into that on the beer side. And then if it's, if it's the clear 
I'm more of a vodka person. I'm not a whiskey person. I don't, I, I don't know why. I just don't, don't, right. don't really care. a whiskey person right now. So it's good that you're different. Yeah, I don't <laughs> really care for that. I do have a friend of mine. I'm not a tequila fan or agave spirit fan, but uh, Mean Mule up in Kansas City, they produce an amazing couple different products. They have a, a bourbon barrel and uh, it's, it's phenomenal. It actually was a barrel that started that our bourbon barrel Norton was in that went to him. That one, one is phenomenal. Again, I don't like whiskeys and I don't like tequila, but I will drink that. And he makes some amazing drinks up there and they make a gin now too from agave. So I could play around with that, but that's Great. kind of what I like. That's, that's, I, I, I should, should have expected nothing less from, from a, from a chef. So, no, um, it comes down to food, though. It, yeah, it all goes down to food. Yeah, that is great. That is great. So, and finally, you have a. We just talked about you creating these unique experiences and at at your location. Can you tell us about any events or promotions you have coming up. You have coming up. Yeah, so we're open three sixty five. I think we close for basically all the major holidays, and that's about it. But we do a regular wine tasting. Here at the winery, you come in, you can, during the weekdays, you can kind of select through what wines you like. On the weekends, we sometimes run a pre-selected list because it's, we, we see so many people that it's hard to, at this stage with our facilities, it's hard to allow everyone to pick, but we make, we're not super strict. You know, we, we make some suggestions and changes and stuff if you haven't been here. And then we offer something new. We offer elevated wine tasting experience in the original press house. So we take, it's more of a guided experience with local, we do a charcuterie board. It's all local meats, cheeses, chocolates, and different snacks or meal. If, if it's two of you, we it is quite a bit of food. And that's really nice because we get to spend, you know, a lot more time. You're talking 45 minutes to an hour for the one. And for our legacy tasting, it's an hour and a half when we go through some riedel, riedel tastings and, and why, you know, glass can impact the wine and then a little bit more larger spread on, on the foods as well. So those are something that we do all the time that you can, you can reserve online. And then some of the big things that we started on a small scale is our wine dinners. And now that we have a, a chef that's doing that full time, it's allowed us to really offer more dinners more often, caterings and stuff like that. So we just had our Norton dinner this past weekend where it was six, six wines level six courses. We ended up tasting eight wines. Cause I always pull out some, some different wines for people and it's, I go in, he, now that he cooked the whole time, I get to talk the whole time. So I get to really go in depth of what we're doing with the wines. I love answering people's questions. And so that's a huge thing that we do. We got our Valentine's day dinners coming up here. Not sure when this will air. So it'll be around Valentine's day tear area. Then we've got some coming up in March for our German dinners. We have a spring dinner. Then we have our farm to table dinner that we use, have a look, use all local products and we raise money for the local food pantry. And that, that is in June, June, what did I say? The ninth, I believe. Yep. And then the June 22nd, we'll have Pappy's out here for our wine and wine and swine 5k. So we do a vineyard trail run through the vineyard and we have the wine slushy trailer at the end, at the finish line. And then we have Pappy's out here doing a whole hog roast. So that's always a, a great time. And then we have a few other events throughout the year, wine club pickup parties, we do some special events for them. So we just, we all have something going on. And then the Herman, Herman wine trail as well. If you're not familiar with that, we have six, seven of those throughout the year, six or seven. Parker, this was really awesome. This, I really, really enjoyed hearing about the winer's history and it's, as it's ups and downs, the vision you have for this and, you know, the, the, the experience and the culture that you bring and you share with your, with people that come in to, to have some of your wine and they leave with more than just wine and they come back for more. It's, it's been a really great interview. I really appreciate your time. I think I could keep on going. 
I mean, I, I, I'd love to, I, we have to do this again. I want to know more about your, your team, the, the, uh, the land, how, how the land's going and, and just even dive deeper into the vision you have. It's really fascinating, but yeah, I just want to say, say thanks again. You even gave me a couple ideas for vision. I had, had somebody online ask me today, what's the di- what's difference between vision and goals? And I think you've given me some good uh, footnotes to kind of answer him with. So I appreciate that as well. So again, Parker, I really appreciate it. Everybody, you get a chance to you find yourself out in Herman, Missouri, check out Adam Pukta Winery and, and check out the property there. It looks beautiful. So again, at Parker, thanks a lot. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. And, and you know, our kind of mission here at the winery is we want to, we want our, our dedication to the wine family and the community to enrich the lives of all of those that we meet and, and serve everyone, you know, cause our, our business is rooted in wine, food and fellowship. And that's kind of a, a, a big, big thing for us. So I appreciate being able to share that, that vision and the mission that we have here at the winery with, with everybody. That's a great way to end. Enjoy the wine, food, and fellowship. Again, Parker, thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to Harvest of Poor, the business of beverages with Matthew Shep. Check the show notes for our guest contact information. And connect with Matthew Shep on LinkedIn today. <laughs>